Welcome to the Simple Good Life Podcast, inspired by the 80-20 way. Here we embrace two profound truths, the law of focus, where less truly is more, and the law of progress, where we achieve more with less effort. Dive in with us as we explore the few things that truly matter, making life richer and more rewarding. Hey there, it's me again, Jesse Stoddard. Remember that middle-aged guy who's been rambling about the simple good life? The one who's neither hip nor cool anymore, but is totally okay with it? Yep, that's me. I've been on this quest to find the simple good life, and let me tell you, it's been, well, an adventure. (laughs) You might be wondering, Jesse, why are you so obsessed with this 80-20 thing? Today, we're diving deep into the magic of the 80-20 principle. And no, it's not a new diet trend or a workout routine. It's about mastering our most precious resource, time. And trust me, I need all the help I can get with that. Between trying to be a gardener and mostly failing, being a dad and just trying to figure life out, time has been slipping through my fingers faster than sand. But enough about me. Let's embark on this journey together and discover how we can reclaim our time, live more intentionally, and find that elusive, simple good life. There's this badge of honor we wear today. It's called busyness. Everywhere you go, you hear people saying, oh, I'm just so busy, like it's some sort of VIP status. But let's be real. Is being busy all it's cracked up to be? I remember my younger self, a city boy, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, hustling through the concrete jungles in New York City. The fast life, the lice, the action, I wanted it all. And boy, was I busy. Busy chasing dreams, busy making plans, and busy, well, being busy. But here's the twist. Fast forward to today, and where do you find me? In a garden. Yep, you heard that right. From the bustling streets of New York City to planting tomatoes. My wife does most of the planting. And you know what? It's made me realize something profound. Sometimes less truly is more. Being busy doesn't always mean being productive or fulfilled. It's like running on a treadmill. You're moving a lot, but are you really getting anywhere? That's the myth of busyness. It promises us success, happiness, and a sense of purpose, but often it leaves us feeling drained, unfulfilled, and wondering if there's more to life than just ticking off to-do lists. All right, let's take a little trip back in time. Picture this, ancient Greece, a place of philosophy, art, and gardening? Yep, you heard that right. Enter Epicurus, our main man of the hour. Now, Epicurus wasn't your typical philosopher. While others were busy debating in the city squares, he and his pals were out in the countryside getting their hands dirty. And and what were they planting? Onions and artichokes, I heard. Yep, not the most glamorous of veggies, but hey, to each their own. Maybe they had a killer artichoke dip recipe. Who knows? But jokes aside, there was a method to their gardening madness. They were onto something big. They realized that city life's hustle and bustle and constant striving for more wasn't the key to happiness. Instead, they found joy in the simple act of planting and nurturing, in the camaraderie of friends, and in the taste of a freshly picked onion or artichoke. Now, I'm not saying we all need to rush out and start planting artichokes, although if that's your thing, more power to you. But what Epicurus teaches us is the importance of identifying our own 20%, that slice of life that brings us 80% of our joy. It's about finding our own garden, whether it's a hobby, a passion, or just spending quality time with loved ones. While the Stoics preached about accepting life as it is, Epicurus was all about actively seeking out pleasure, but not in the way you might think. It wasn't about indulgence, but finding pleasure in simplicity, connection, and living in alignment with nature. And that's what the 80-20 principle is all about. It's not about doing more, but about doing what truly matters. As I meandered through my garden the other day, I was struck by a simple gardening truth, the art of pruning. There's something almost meditative about snipping away the dead or overgrown branches, giving the healthy ones room to breathe and flourish. It's got me thinking, isn't life a lot like that garden? We've all got those branches, activities, commitments, Even relationships that have become overgrown are sapping our energy. They're the time wasters, the thing that keep us busy but don't really add value to our lives. (laughs) Do I really need to watch that 10th consecutive episode of a Netflix show or 
endlessly scroll through social media comparing my behind the scenes to everyone else's highlight reel, or attending that meeting that could have been an email, you get the drift. Just like in gardening, there's power in letting go, in pruning away the unnecessary to make room for what truly matters. It's not about being ruthless, but about being intentional, asking ourselves, is this adding to my joy, my purpose, my 20%? And if not, maybe it's time for a little snip snip. By eliminating these time wasters, we free up space, not just in our schedules, but in our minds and hearts. Space to focus on our passions, our loved ones, and yes, even our gardens, be they literal or metaphorical. I do have a little confession. I'm not actually a gardener or a farmer or anything like that. I'm actually a former city guy and I run a marketing agency and have a few side gigs and other fun stuff I'm doing in my life, which we'll explore in another time. The truth is my wife's the real gardener and I'm just the occasional muscle helping her out, moving a wheelbarrow or whatever needs to be done. The point is that I've seen and grown to appreciate it. We had this grand vision when we started our garden, rows of tomatoes here, a patch of sunflowers there, maybe even a little herb corner. But without a plan, it was just chaos. Plants competing for space, sunlight, and nutrients. Life's a lot like that, isn't it? We have dreams, goals, and a laundry list of things we want to achieve. But it's easy to get overwhelmed without a plan or prioritizing. Imagine planting sunflowers, tomatoes, and basil all in one tiny plot without any order. You'd end up with a sunflower shaded tomato and some very confused basil. That's what happens when we don't prioritize our tasks. That's where time blocking comes in. Think of it as your gardening layout for life. Instead of letting tasks grow wild and free, taking over your entire day, you allocate specific plots of time for each one. This is the hour for brainstorming, the half hour for emails, and yes, this is the sacred non-negotiable time for family, self-care, or just staring at the clouds. <laughs> It's not about being rigid, but about being intentional. By blocking out time for what truly matters, we ensure that the important things are clear from the urgent, but not so important ones. And just like in gardening with some planning and prioritization, you'll see your life bloom in ways you never imagined. All right, let's get real for a moment. I've been talking a lot about gardens, time, and the 80-20 principle, but how does this all come together in real life? Just the other morning, I was in our greenhouse, lost in the world of audiobooks, soaking in wisdom about simplifying life. The sun shone, the plants were thriving, and life felt peaceful. But then my friend and personal training client, Sean, popped by. She handed me a coffee, bless her heart, and we chatted. I proudly showed her our garden's latest updates, and we walked around. But as we talked, Sean mentioned a struggle she's been facing, watering her massive garden. It takes her up to three hours a day. <laughs> That's when it hit me. The 80-20 principle was staring me right in the face and in my garden. Thanks to my genius wife, our garden is on an automatic watering system. It's a game changer. Not only does it save us heaps of time, but it also ensures our plants get just the right amount of water they need. And our greenhouse, it's got this nifty system that collects rainwater from our shed's roof. And the best part, it automatically tops up whenever the water gets low. No manual refills, no guesswork. It's the perfect example of the 80-20 principle in action. We put in the upfront effort setting up these systems and now we reap the benefits daily. Instead of spending hours watering plants, we get to enjoy the garden, spend time with family, or in my case, get lost in another audiobook. It's all about finding those small changes, those 20% actions that can lead to 80% of the results. And trust me, when you start looking, you'll see opportunities everywhere. People often want to know how much time I spend watering for my wife. And here's the magic right here. You set the run time. For example, how long should it water? 15 minutes and it's on a 24 hour cycle. So I don't do anything. You can hear it early in the morning cranking on. And then you have these main trunks, lines, and then smaller lines that come off. You see all these little smaller lines. My wife's pretty awesome, and she figured out how to just get them in every single plant. And so all of these, and then it runs actually right there, the base of the <laughs> door and goes back in over on this side. And all of these are on branches and 
the big trunks. In fact, there's one, this is the end of one rolling, coming around here and the tree and all of those, this odd, beautiful plant with this strange fruit that's edible, all of this over here in the corner, all of these flowers. In fact, the system keeps going. Now, I have to water right here and here just because there's a couple, you can see the end of the watering system was there and the succulents here don't need quite as much, but I, I water those and a couple of those plants up there don't. And then I gotta remember to water that one. <laughs> it ain't on the system. And this is optional, these do fine without it. Obviously we don't water our grass, you can see. We're not grass waterers, we're vegetable and flower people. All of this is on the system. All of these beautiful flowers and the tomatoes. Oh, look at this. Got some good ones here that looking like they might be tasty, ready to go. Let's get one of these. Oh yeah, that's not bad. Could be a little redder, but I'm gonna eat that. Yum. Now, off of the gutter here, all up spring especially, there's tons of water and fills this up. And there's, uh, for now, extra plants are in here and they get watered from the bottom, pretty much just add a little water. You can see this tree got a little dried out, but it's coming back. So I guess a nursery there and a swamp. <laughs> and then these cherry tomatoes. The more orange they are, the more ready they are to eat. Collard greens. And all of this is on the watering system. All of this, all of these raised beds, every single one. And so we used to have to spend hours watering all this stuff. And now the entire system is connected. This is the south side of this house. So there's a lot of sun and warmth. And this old rickety fence, we're afraid to get rid of it because it creates this little microclimate in here. And a lot of the plants love it. The tomatoes love it. Now, you'll see just a random mix mash this year. And that was by choice. We wanted to have more flowers and variety and let the ground rest. Because normally we just fill this with tomatoes. And we have so many tomatoes we could feed a army. And then a couple of these other smaller setups here, little raised beds and tubs and whatnot. You'll notice, what's this? It's on the system. Don't have to water it. Self-watering. We also have a lot of self-watering concepts in the chicken coop. So if you look in here, you'll see that bucket there is, and it's got a little thing at the bottom and they hit that and the food drops. The white bucket behind it is a watering bucket another food bucket hanging, and then a watering bucket there. And there, a chicken condo, chicken apartment that my wife made is back there. And it's pretty handy, by the way. She put this together. I barely helped her. What a lazy husband, but I helped her just set this up, but she built it. It's all her. Deserves credit. And this is the previous one, but now they've outgrown that. And cool chicken coop. So here, there's a solar fan. There's a little solar panel. So when it's hot, like right now, it's blowing out the hot air to keep it from getting to be like an oven in there. Oh, hello, girls. A couple of them here. We got five total. Now you'll notice, I already took the eggs, but look, oh, already. Now we got a fake egg in here. That's this one, just telling them, hey, don't forget, this is where you lay eggs. And then we got a couple good looking eggs here. I'm gonna take those, get those, either put them to eat for me or water glass them. And then here we're gonna, I don't remember the real name of this, but I call her Broody. Hey, Broody. She ain't too happy me checking her out here. She wants to sit there all day long and hatch an egg. Come on. She's trying to hatch the fake egg. All right, nothing else in there. She doesn't like me too much, I'm bugging her. She's broody, as they say. That means that she just wants to sit there all the time. This is a chicken run here. And this is so that they got this little place to travel all the way to the other side. It's like a tunnel. You can see him going through it. And then this is the shed that my dad and I built. My late father, God rest his soul, he built this thing mostly and I helped. And that kind of storage shed and tools. It's a mess right now, but you get around to it one of these years, right? And that chicken run goes right behind there and here we go, another area. So we kind of rotate them around. This is the old coop. I'll lock this down, we'll do something with it later before they outgrew it when it was just the two girls here, the bossy ones, before this one was added. And uh, so this is a dust bath. We call it kind of like the nuclear waste dump. These are devastated lands. That's uh, what chickens do, but comes really good soil later 
for planting. So if we move them or migrate them around, then this would be one of the best spots to plant. For now, it's just our area for them. And you'll notice, look at what I found down here. Sometimes it's been a little bit buried, but every now and then you see one. What's, oh, it's connected to what? The blueberries. I've already harvested a ton of these blueberries. Oh, like they're coming back again. Several bushes here. This is all on, there's a trunk line and then individual lines to these bushes here. And then also this other set of, there's a ton of these on here right now. You can see the black current which is a bit of a bitter berry for a lot of people. I think they're actually pretty good. I just eat them, but most people, my wife included, just pretty much takes them and turns them into jams and jellies and concentrates, and they're really good that way. It takes a little bit of work to do it. And that's all of this is on the same watering system. So you'll notice not a whole lot of watering requirement from the front to the back so far. Now there is an exception which is my aquaponic system in the greenhouse. So off of this roof, this roof, now this was an interesting story. My dad built this deck and it was gonna be something different. And then a friend of mine came and helped, George, great guy, helped build this out of what had started as a different project. And it's another shed basically for storage. But off of this, we have that PVC running into this tank, 320 US gallons. What I love about this bad boy is on a good rain, that thing will fill almost completely within, you know, around here in the Pacific Northwest, there's that much rain. And that hose travels down in here into the greenhouse and then runs along the wall and goes over there. Now, why? Because in aquaponics, you need a lot of water and it conserves water. It's very conservative compared to traditional gardening where you're pouring it off and it runs right off into the dirt and keeps going but there's still evaporation a little bit. Anyway, they're using up a lot of water to grow, obviously. And then it evaporates off their leaves. That's what I meant to say. But they use a lot of water to grow. So it's not like you're circulating water, but it's not like you can't ever put in more water in it. You have to. And these guys, this is a constant height, one pump system. So when you look at this fish tank, it's got to remain one, one level, okay? And you got water coming in which is coming in from over there. It's, there's a sump and it pumps partially underground. One of them comes from underground and the other one's coming from these grow towers. But anyway, it comes from the sump, pumps it into here and right in to the intake here, which then that's gonna always be one height because as soon as it gets up to a certain level, it drains back out the large drain pipe, goes underneath and back into the sump. So it's constantly circulating water You'll also notice some bubbles back there that's from aeration that I've added because fish need that and love that. Yeah, they get probably enough aeration just from that water to survive, but I like them to be happy. And these are my happy fish. They already ate, so they're not coming up to grab a bite to eat. A little bit afternoon siesta time, so they're slow. Just fine with me. And then I also have an automatic feeder, by the way, considering it's not, it's talking about automatic watering. There's also automatic feeder. I give them a snack sometimes, but that's about it. So you can see now, where does that tank water go? That magical hose I said that disappeared. It goes along the wall and it comes over here. But if you notice this hose is the same one and it goes right down here into this cool little float switch. Now right now it's under the water, but if it gets a little too out of the water, then all of a sudden the water starts flowing out of there and replacing, and replacing from what we've used up that way we never lose too much water in here. It's always about the same height. This is draining right now. That's for another video to explain what's going on, but we can at least look at it, it's fun. It's gonna be draining real fast down through the auto siphon. The little vortex that's been formed in there and the, which is a bit of physics magic. There's no mechanical parts. There's no electricity included in that. It just happens naturally to the way it's set up. And that'll stop, once it empties, it'll stop like a toilet flush. And then this water will gradually raise back up and flood it back up in the bed. And then it gets high and then it drains. So it's flood drain system all the time, 24 seven. Now there is some electricity. Let me get that little flower out of there. A little electricity that powers that pump down there. That's the main pump and it goes both directions out. One of those goes to the fish tank. There's a secondary pump. That pump down there is for the grow towers. It goes right over to these guys. Grow towers were not a main focus this year, but we have them running. 
some weird outputs there. While I'm here, you can see the green onions love it. And this, this plant that's going insane is called watercress. It's very nutritious and it really loves aquaponics. And then uh, cucumbers love it too. I've already harvested most of them. Let's see if I got a, another big one left. I do. I should probably pull that one today or tomorrow. That one's ready to eat. I already have two of them though. I got to eat. So watering, how do you water? It's best to make it all automatic. <laughs> and I've done my very best to make this as automatic as possible to make my life easier. There's still some maintenance involved. Things can always break, but imagine the hours that you save by not walking around watering your garden and having to constantly carry buckets in to fill this thing up. And by the way, you can't just throw too much chlorine water in here because of the fish, but you could in a normal garden. So I have to put dechlorinator in it, that's city water, or let it sit for a long time. So that's why it's better just collect the rain water and get it done that way. I hope you enjoyed the tour of our watering system. All right, folks, it's challenge time. And no, I'm not asking you to do 100 push-ups or eat a ghost pepper. This challenge is all about introspection and discovery. I want you to take a walk in your own garden. It could be your actual garden, workspace, daily routine, or even a quiet moment of reflection. The point is to find a space where you can truly assess where your time and energy are going. Now, I know not everyone has a garden with an automatic watering system, and if you do, high five. But we all have areas in our lives where we can apply the 80-20 principle. So here's the challenge. Over the next week, I want you to conduct an 80-20 time audit. Grab a notebook, a digital app, or even just some sticky notes. Track where your time goes. What activities are you spending the most time on? And more importantly, which of those activities bring you the most joy, satisfaction, or results? Identify your 20% spikes, those golden nuggets that bring about 80% of your happiness, fulfillment, and productivity. And once you've identified them, think about how you can prioritize them even more in your life. And hey, if you find out that watching cat videos is in your 20%, that brings 80% of your joy, no judgment here. Just maybe don't tell your boss. Well, folks, as the sun sets on this episode, I find myself pondering, am I truly living the simple good life? The honest answer? Maybe not entirely. But hey, life isn't about having all the answers right away. It's about the journey, the discoveries, the missteps, and the little victories along the way. I'm on this winding path, trying to find that elusive balance, that sweet spot of simplicity and joy. And I genuinely hope you'll lace up your metaphorical hiking boots and join me on this adventure. Who knows? We might stumble upon some hidden treasures, or at the very least share a few laughs and aha moments. So what's in store for our next rendezvous? Well, let's just say we're going to dive even deeper, unearthing more gems from the world of the 80-20 principle and exploring what it truly means to live a life of purpose and passion when it comes to your health. Until then, keep seeking, keep questioning, and most importantly, keep laughing. Catch you in the next episode. Thank you for joining us on The Simple Good Life Journey. As we continue to focus on what truly enriches our lives and make progress with less strain, we invite you to reflect, simplify, and grow. If today's episode resonated with you, please subscribe and share. Until next time, remember, focus on the few and achieve more with less.